Hey everyone, Steven here, and today I'm finally doing my review of the ROG PG42UQ OLED monitor. Initially I thought I would get this done sooner, but I'd figured this would allow me more time with not only this monitor, but just an OLED in general, as burn-in is a real concern here, and I'm happy to report that after 8 months of use, I don't have any burn-in so far, and this monitor is still one of my favorites to date. Now I always cover specs in my reviews, but to save time here, I'm just going to repurpose the audio from my initial impressions video, but I will be covering the panel settings here, which is something that I didn't do in that first video. After that, I'll get into what I like, don't like, and then wrap up with the gray area. With that being said though, let's get into the specs. The PG42UQ is a 42-inch 4K OLED monitor with a 120Hz refresh rate that can reach 138Hz through the overclocking settings. This covers 98% of the DCI P3 color space and 133% of the sRGB color space. The typical brightness is 450 nits with peak brightness being close to 800 nits with HDR enabled. This has a typical contrast ratio of 135,000 to 1, and with HDR enabled, this jumps to 1.5 million to 1. This has true 10-bit color with HDR and a 0.1 millisecond gray-to-gray -gray response time. For ports, you will find one DP 1.4 port, two HDMI 2.0 ports, two HDMI 2.1 ports, a headphone jack, optical audio out port, and a USB hub with four USB 3.2 gen, two ports, and a USB 3.0 signal port. This features two 10-watt speakers and a 15-watt subwoofer, which I haven't used a monitor with a built-in subwoofer before, and it's pretty noticeable with the rich bass this can achieve. The volume here can get incredibly loud, so I won't do a full-blown sound test here, but I do want to at least showcase the audio in a couple of games so you can hear the richness this can achieve. Keep in mind this will sound way better in person. Moving on, this has a tilt of 5 degrees forward and 5 degrees backwards for the mechanical adjustments, but that's it. So this is basically a TV. This is VESA compatible with a 300mm by 300mm pattern, so you would need a TV mount for this, and it's quite heavy coming in at 44 pounds. So if you do plan on mounting this, make sure it can handle the weight. Other features this have are custom heat sinks to keep this 8% cooler to potentially help with any burn-in. This has a RWGB subpixel layout for better text quality. On the top you will find a webcam or tripod mount socket, and next to that is a USB port also for easy access for the webcam. On the bottom you have the ROG logo that illuminates when powered on, and underneath this you have the power button on the right hand side, the input button on the far left, and in the center is the menu button. This comes with a carrying bag that has the power cable, DP cable, HDMI cable, USB extension cable, a very nice remote control, the user manual and warranty card, and last you get a calibration report, which I always like when monitors come with these, and this has a delta E of less than two. Moving on, we have the panel settings now, and with this, the first tab is the gaming tab, and then within that, you have overclocking first, and you can adjust this all the way up to 138 hertz, which is gonna be 18 above something like an LG C2. Underneath that, you have Adaptive Sync, and with Adaptive Sync, this is G-Sync compatible, and it will list that here. And for any of the gameplay footage from PC, I do have that enabled for that. Haven't had any issues, it works really well here. Underneath this, you're going to have the Game Plus tab, and then you'll find all the different things, FPS counter, crosshair, sniper, timer, stopwatch, things like that, if you do want to use this, which is nice. Underneath that we have the game visual and let's go ahead and start running through these because these are the presets here. 
Now I do have this on FPS mode to start. That's the mode I've been using the most, but we have a ton of options here, starting with the scenery mode. And then after that, you're going to have the racing mode, cinema mode, RTS slash RPG mode, FPS, again, the one I've used for most of this video here, SRGB mode, MOBA, which this one actually looks pretty cool. It just looks cool with the backdrop here, but we do have the MOBA mode here. And then last is going to be the user mode. Going back to the gaming tab here though, underneath game visual is the shadow boost. You have off three levels and then dynamic adjustment. Obviously dynamic adjustment is going to adjust dynamically in real time when you're playing games. Underneath this tab, we have the image tab. You have brightness, uniform brightness, contrast, vivid pixel, HDR settings that we'll talk about here in a second, aspect control, and then blue light filter. But let's go ahead and actually look at the uniform brightness here, because this is a unique feature to this monitor. So with this, I'm going to make sure that the brightness is turned all the way up before I turn this on. And what it does is it essentially dims everything to make sure that there are no areas of the screen that are brighter than another. And with this, you're gonna notice when you have a small window on screen, if it is white, it is very bright. When you blow that up to full screen size, it is going to dim overall. So the uniform brightness here will keep everything the same level of brightness. Remember, OLEDs don't have high nits in terms of the peak brightness. So it's going to be able to hit that high amount of nits in a smaller window. And then when you blow it up, it just can't sustain that. So me personally, it's not something that I think is a big deal when I'm just using this for general use in gaming, but I think for anybody that does content creation or you're editing photos in Photoshop, this may be a bigger deal for you because you want to make sure that everything is where you want it to be in terms of the brightness levels and things like that. And you don't want to mess up just because you think it's a certain brightness and it's not really because it has more to do with the screen and the amount of nits that it has. Next up, we're going to look at the different HDR modes here. I have a photo mode pulled up with Horizon Forbidden West. That way we can actually just showcase this without any movement in the background. So most things are going to be blocked out when you have HDR on because that's really only the thing that you can adjust. But with this, currently have console HDR on, but let's look at gaming HDR right here. I've noticed it really changes the shadows and the highlights the most with these different settings. So this is the first one. And then after that, we have the cinema HDR. It seems to make everything a little bit more like matte or dull, where the other ones kind of bring out those shadow details a little bit more. And then the last one is console HDR. This is probably my favorite. And this one just makes everything a little bit more vibrant. It pops just a little bit more. If you click brightness adjust on this, it's gonna let you know that you are affecting the perceptual quantizer curve. So do keep that in mind. Moving on to the next tab here, we have the color tab. And with the color tab, the first thing that you're gonna notice here is the display color space. We have sRGB and DCI-P3. Let's go ahead and take a look at these two. So starting with the sRGB here, I don't know how well the camera is going to pick up on these two, but after this, we have the DCI-P3. It doesn't really showcase on camera, it seems like, but in person, DCI-P3 has a little bit more contrast. It's a little bit more vivid than sRGB, in my opinion. I could see this being important, again, going back to content creators. If you're editing photos in Photoshop or maybe you need it for something in Premiere Pro, this is going to be a great option to have. But personally, again, if you're just a general gamer, I've just left mine on sRGB, but you do have the two options and I like the ability that you can adjust this based off your use case. Shifting over now to color temperature from 4,000 to 10,000 K and user mode. So we're gonna run through all of these really quick just so you get a glimpse of what they would look like. Obviously 4,000 K is gonna be warmer and then as we go down, it'll start getting cooler all the way up to that 10,000 K. In the user mode, you get to adjust the RGB here to your percentage and liking. So that is something you can adjust if you want to, if it seems to be leaning a little bit towards a color that you don't potentially want. Finishing out the menu on this though, you have saturation, the six axis saturation, and that's gonna give you 
all six colors that you can edit. And then last we have the gamma 1.8 all the way up to 2.6. And so you can adjust this as well. I've left this at 2.2 for the whole video. Moving on, we have input select next with auto input detection. You have the one display port and then the four HDMI inputs. I'm not gonna showcase it, but you do have picture in picture and picture by picture. So if you have something else plugged into this, you get to do that, which is great. We have my favorites and you get to create different shortcuts and presets if you want to. And so here, I'm just gonna showcase the list of things that you could do. With this, you're actually adjusting what is the dial on the bottom of the screen, the menu button dial going to adjust. So you can customize that there. Another nice touch, I always like when monitors have this feature for anybody that does want the next level of customization for these menu settings. Last is going to be system setup. Here we have a language, sound, USB setup, power indicator, power key lock, key lock, power setting, and on-screen display setup. Next, looking at the sound here, you have volume, mute, sound source, sound output, which is what I'm looking at right there, and then the audio wizard. For the audio wizard, we have three different modes that we can choose from. We have music, movie, and game mode. I've kept this mainly on movie mode. It's hard to see right here, but this is the movie mode that I'm currently highlighting. After that, we have a USB setup in the USB hub. Do you want it to power devices when it is turned off or do you want it off when it's in standby mode? Just two options here with this. Now, the rest of this I've already mentioned here with what these things are, but when you scroll to the second portion of the menu here, you're going to find the screen protection. This is a big one here because this has a feature where you can do a pixel cleansing. And with that, the hope is that we're not gonna get burn in on this screen. It does cue you every eight hours of use to actually run this. And the whole thing takes about six minutes here. So we have the screensaver option. Underneath that is pixel cleaning. I say cleansing sometimes, but we have screen move underneath that. Typically I've left this on medium. You can turn this off. I don't notice it and a lot of other people do, but it shifts the pixels in a certain time cycle where you will see everything shift over. Again, this is just to prevent burn-in, but I don't personally notice that, but I do notice for static stuff, a lot of people like to leave that off. And then last, you have adjust logo brightness. So for any static logo or heads up display or anything like that with this, it will dim that automatically. I typically leave this on just because again, you don't want burn-in from that. After that, we have the DSC. HDMI, CEC, information, and then all reset. I won't be covering that stuff in this video, but that is there if you wanna look it up. So now that I've covered all of the specs in the panel settings, let's get into what I like about this monitor. I'm gonna to try to be as concise as possible with this because I have a tendency to repeat myself. I do wanna mention on this, I will have everything labeled. So if it's standard definition, it'll say SDR. And then if it has the high dynamic range, it'll say HDR. With this though, OLEDs, just with this one, I'm sure they're all very similar. I haven't tried all of them, but in terms of the tech, it looks incredible. So this monitor looks amazing. It is the best picture quality I've seen in person to date. The colors here are incredibly vibrant and bright. So yeah, we have some of the things where the nits may not be as high, but in terms of the color itself, the colors on this thing just pop. If you compare this side by side to like a VA or an IPS panel, you're gonna know that this is an OLED because of how vibrant that it gets. And of course, because you have the true blacks with this, there is no glow. You don't have like the IPS or VA panel glow because the backlight technology here is different. So again, picture quality is the best I have seen to date by far. The HDR experience, I'm not huge on HDR, but with this one, huge difference. Like the HDR experience here is incredible. So again, the colors are gonna look bright and vibrant. You're gonna get those true blacks. The high amount of local dimming zones with this because each pixel is backlit. I mean, this is the ultimate HDR experience in my opinion. The other monitors, they've been good, especially when they have high local dimming zones, like some of the Samsung monitors. It's just not gonna be able to compete with this. This is going to be the top notch HDR experience in my opinion. And the good news with this monitor is HDR or SDR, both look incredible. 
I go back and forth between those two different modes. Sometimes I'm in the mood for HDR for a while and then I'll go back to SDR. They both look great. So you have two incredible modes where some monitors like the SDR looks really good and then HDR is like, okay. This one, you don't have to worry. Either mode is gonna be really, really good. And this is across the board, regardless of whether or not you're using a PC or you're playing on console, it just looks great. I have a mixture of footage with this video, so I'm trying to showcase and make sure that I show PC, but also consoles as well in here. So you guys can see, it just looks great across the board. Next, the response time. This thing is incredibly fast. So in the panel settings, there is no option for overdrive or anything like that because it doesn't need it. This monitor is so fast in terms of the pixel response time here that if I'm running a UFO test and I'll showcase footage now, there's no visible ghosting smearing. I'm not seeing black trailing. I'm not seeing inverse ghosting. I'm not seeing anything like that with this. And that's again, what my eye can visibly see here. If I slow this down or like take a, a snapshot of it, all you see is the transition frames in person. You wouldn't even see those. It just looks like a continuous UFO across the screen that then translates to gameplay. I'm not seeing anything with gameplay across the board, whether that's like a first person shooter, that's really fast paced or slower paced games. Everything here looks incredible in terms of the response time. And this is the fastest response time monitor that I've personally used. And I can definitely tell in games, everything just plays smoother because of it. And OLEDs across the board have the fastest response time of anything on the market right now. Again, you get that pixel response time. We're just seeing like sub one second, right? You're getting 0.1 milliseconds with this monitor, but some out there are even faster. You're getting like 0 0.03 milliseconds. So we're finally at this stage now where everything is happening as fast as it can actually happen. And this is going to beat out what we're seeing with a lot of VA and IPS panel monitors. Now, even if they're one millisecond gray to gray, I would say that these are pretty close, but some of the other ones out there where it's the motion picture response time and they're like one millisecond, two, three, four milliseconds, you're gonna notice more ghosting, black smearing, trailing, and things like that in general with those monitors. Here, not an issue. This plays and looks great. The last part is kind of collection of a lot of small things that I like here. I do like all the little things that we find with this that we might not find on other OLED monitors, especially if you're comparing it to something like the LG C2. I'm going to actually talk about that here in a little bit, but we're getting the DP port. We do have a nice remote here, which a C2 would have that, but we have the nice remote. We have the webcam actual like threading that you could screw a webcam in on the top. And then you have the USB port right there. You have the USB port expansions on the back. That is a huge one for me. I always like when monitors have that. So the gamer aesthetics and then the sub pixel layout here. If you do write a lot, I don't know that this is going to be the monitor that you're going to be like, Hey, I need to have this one, but let's say you do a lot of workflow stuff. You're editing content and you like to play games. I think it looks good. I can't, say what the difference is between this and like the LG C2 because I haven't looked at those side by side. But in terms of just my general experience with writing scripts for videos, editing in Adobe Premiere Pro, it all looks really good in my opinion. I'm not noticing any text fringing or anything like that, but this monitor being 42 inches, I blow up the text so that it feels more appropriate to the size. I don't want to have to squint at the monitor the whole time. And I've done that across the board with any monitor that is larger. So I usually don't have issues with this looking at certain applications, Adobe Premiere Pro, where the text is smaller, though, I don't notice any fringing with this either. So it all looks great. And that does translate to games as well. So any game that has a lot of text in it, that all looks really solid here. Last is going to be the speakers. They are really good. Like the different modes here, how loud they get the subwoofer in this, it almost feels like overkill like these speakers are really really good they are top notch they get incredibly loud so you could easily use this my reference is going to seem weird but if i'm having a house party and this was in the living room for whatever reason you could use this to actually 
play music and it would handle the party just fine. Again, it gets incredibly loud and at that top volume, I'm not hearing any breaks in audio or anything like that. Now, for my first impressions video, I had the weird issue with the subwoofer. It stopped happening. It hasn't happened again. It would just give like this loud, I don't even know what to call it. It's just a loud noise that it was making. It stopped doing that. Haven't had any issues since then, which has been great. Don't know why it happened, but something to be mindful of that may be a potential issue. They kind of went on the fritz for a little bit and then it just resolved itself for whatever reason. But yeah, I think by far these are the best speakers that I've heard on any monitor that I've reviewed to date. So that is going to wrap it up for the good. Now let's shift over to the bad. Number one thing here is burn in potential. This is across the board for any OLED, but the fact that at some point you may have something burned into the image is a big bummer when you're paying this very premium price tag for these monitors. Now with this, I will say, Asus has built in a bunch of features to help prevent this. We have the pixel cleaning here that we talked about earlier, the screen saver, the screen move, and adjust logo brightness. So all of these are measures to prevent burn-in. The downside, the warranty here is two years, but for their LCD monitors, it's three years. I think that's a bit of a bummer. It should at least still be the same as the LCD monitors here. Uh, the two years, that's kind of a, a letdown with this. It's a big disappointment here. Next is going to be the low peak brightness or nits. Again, this is something that you're going to find across the board with OLEDs. So with this, we showcased it. You have just a lot of white on screen. Everything is going to become a little bit more dull or it won't be uniform. They have that uniform brightness to combat this, but that makes the screen just dimmer overall. It does help smooth that out so you're not having these small windows that are incredibly bright, but personally, I just leave it off. When I'm gaming, I don't notice this much. I don't play a lot of games also where there's just a ton of white on screen. But if you do play games where they're usually pretty bright, you may notice that this just doesn't look as bright as it would on any type of other panel, whether that's IPS or VA or just your regular TV screen here. So just keep that in mind when you get this, that may be an issue. You can combat it, like I said, with a uniform brightness or just crank the brightness all the way up. There are things that do help this adjusting settings in your Nvidia or AMD control panel. But overall, I, I just wish these OLEDs would catch up with the nits here. It may be a couple more years before we get there though. Last is going to be the price here. This is still at its launch price for the most part. I'm in the middle of recording this and then they dropped it down $100, but overall this is usually sitting at $13.99 or $12.99 as a current sale. That's really expensive for this and it's been out basically a year now. And in that time, a lot of other OLEDs have come out. So the marketplace just has more options now, but for me, it just, it's too expensive. This is just a very high price tag. It has some cool features to it, but looking at what else is out there, I just think at this point, this price needs to come down. It needs to be more towards $1,000 with this. That actually shifts us over now to comparing this to the LG C2, because if I'm looking at that monitor, if I get the C2, not the C3, at the 42 inches, you can find that in the 800s on sale, it can creep up into the 900s close to $1,000 with that, but that's still like three, four, five hundred dollars $500 cheaper than this monitor. Now, you don't get the DP port with that, so you have these just different trade outs, right? This one has a DP port, you only have HDMI with the C2. With the C2, you get smart TV features. This has none, so you're not getting Netflix built in and stuff like that. Of course, you could just run Netflix through your computer or through a console, so you have workarounds, but that just adds a step where the C2 is just going to have it ready to go right off the remote. And so if you don't want to turn on the console or the PC, you don't have to. You can just watch whatever show that you want with that. The last difference here is going to be the Hertz. So the C2, the C3, that's locked in at 120 Hertz. This one has 138 when it is overclocked. I don't know how much of a difference you're going to notice in the 18 frames. It's going to be there. It's just, I don't know how noticeable it will be to each individual. And is that worth the extra 
like I said, three, four, five hundred dollars that you're going to pay over one of those. So the comparison here, it's just, again, it's so competitive with these OLEDs right now. I just think that they should have come in with a lower price point on this monitor, especially again, a year out from when they launched it. Oh, one last thing the ROG has here compared to the C2 or C3 is that this can actually tilt, those cannot, they're just stuck there. Now all of these can be mounted if you wanted to. The difference in weight though is pretty crazy because the ROG here is 44 pounds. It is very heavy. Now that is with the, the stand and the stand is just all metal, but comparing this to the C2 specifically, that's just a little over 22 pounds with the stand. So there is quite a substantial difference in the weight here. I just haven't felt like actually mounting this. I have one that could potentially hold it, but I just don't want to mess with the setup here because of how heavy this is. And that would be something I think most people should be mindful of is if you're going to get this again, one, it's heavy, but two, if you're going to try to mount it, it has to be able to handle this weight. So that is going to wrap up this video. I tried to cover as much as I could, all the information that I would want people to know before they purchase this. And so hopefully it has helped you in regards to your purchasing decision. For me personally, I love this in terms of just like a monitor, the OLED tech. I don't know if I went through and did it again, if I would be compelled to specifically get this monitor. So if I'm sitting there looking at the two, I could get the C3 for about 1146 right now. It kind of fluctuates in price as well. So you could get the latest LG OLED if you wanted to at a cheaper price point. And they have a ton of different sizes as well. So you could go up and you could get it in a 65 inch if you wanted to. So again, there's just a ton of different options out there and these are all coming in at a lower price point specifically needing a DP port. If you do want those extra FPS with overclocking this, the 18 extra, these are things that may potentially draw you towards this or some of the other features. Like again, you can mount that webcam up top. There's little things, the tilt that are really, really great. The speakers, again, the best that I've actually heard on any monitor to date, but does that justify that very huge increase in the price tag when comparing it to some of the other options that are out there. But that is 100% up to you guys. I do not like telling people what to do with their money. For me personally, I think if I did it again, I would probably go most likely with the LG C2 or C3. I'm still happy that I actually got to experience the OLED technology with this monitor. Wait until later this year if you're on the fence, if you don't want to get that LG C2 or C3, see if we get some big time sales. I am suspecting that come Black Friday, we may see some big discounts on this monitor, but if you don't want to wait that long, again, up to you, do what you want with your money. Just keep an eye out for those sales so you can get this at a better price point. So that is going to be it for this one, everybody. I will have a link for this in the description if you want to pick it up, as well as the LG C2 and C3. And then some other options I think you would potentially want to consider and just look at will be there as well. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you like the video, hit the like button for me as it helps the channel out. If you want to continue to follow along with all my content, hit the subscribe button. And as always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.